words about uh, this particular uh, uh, project, uh, which is the context for the ontologies that we will uh, discuss. Um, now, first of all, uh, Leon will uh, discuss uh, in general, after my brief introduction, um, uh, the, the pipeline and kind of overview and the ontological uh, model uh, of uh, this uh, of this uh, project, and then we'll uh, zoom in on uh, the uh, the tool that we use for um, for uh, data disintegration. Then I will come back and discuss the, the, the model that I've been working on with uh, Foruska on uh, um, uh, historical uh, storylines, the storylines of historical evidence. Um, and then uh, we will have uh, the discussion afterwards. Um, so um, uh, Leon and I will be uh, presenting. Um, Voruska is official not working um, at the moment, but she uh, agreed at least to be present here for uh, specific questions and also perhaps if you want to, to discuss the models in more in more detail. Um, so I see that uh, um, um, Leon already put up the first slide. So um, the aim of the project is uh, to uh, uh, build a research infrastructure, just not to do research, but to build a research infrastructure to get a better understanding of the the dynamics, uh, the historical processes in the creative industries of the Dutch Golden Age. And we are in particular, are we interested in uh, the overlap between the various branches of the creative industries? So we're not just looking at painting, but also at uh, literature and uh, um, a theater. And uh, so all forms of, of, uh, of interactions of those creative industries of the Dutch Golden Age. And we are very much interested in uh, the producers and the consumers of those creative industries, and they're not just the elite culture of uh, of Amsterdam in the in the 17th century, but actually of all layers of society. So that's more or less what we bring try to bring uh, together in our uh, uh, project. So uh, the next, uh, uh, Leon. Um, so this is what we more or less uh, try to do. We try to bring together um, semantic web technologies with uh, multi-agent uh, technologies and then combining both um, linked data of existing sets and, uh, of, uh, and we are creating new data sets and linked uh, later. Um, the, in the interaction between those data sets, we try to capture uh, in, uh, in storylines and we develop ontologies uh, for that. Then we also try all that data and all our tools that we develop in the context of our project. Uh, we try to, um, to create interfaces for that. And we, uh, in particular, are interested in interfaces for interaction. So not just the representation of the information at the end of the, of the project, but to give uh, the means to the users in all stages of, uh, of the project. Uh, or in the all stages of their own research to interact with uh, our data. And finally, we uh, tried uh, to bring the, together uh, handwriting text recognition and hard crowdsourcing to disclose uh, 2 million scans of notary acts, uh, in mainly of the city archives of uh, Amsterdam. As I said, we were uh, in particular interested in all layers of the society and uh, we hope with disclosing this information in probate inventories to get a better understanding uh, what people are were having uh, in the houses and then just in all the houses and all layers of uh, society. Um, next, uh, Leon. Um, so we work uh, together in, in, in a large consortium with of academic uh, institutions. So there are multiple universities uh, involved, uh, the University of Amsterdam, uh, the Free University of uh, Amsterdam, Utrecht University, the Huygens Institute for the History of the Netherlands, uh, all sorts of academic institutions, and we are working together closely with all sorts of uh, national cult cultural heritage institutions, like the Rijksmuseum, uh, the Academie Netherlands Institute for Art History, the National Library, and in particular, and that's important in the context of this presentation, with uh, uh, the Amsterdam uh, City um, uh, Archives. So this is uh, more or less... Uh, very brief an introduction uh, to the project and Leon will now take over by first giving an overview of the pipeline and then he will zoom in on the ontological uh, model of the archival uh, resources and on the lenticular lens uh, tool that is used for uh, uh, allowing the users to um, 
clean up the data and to, the, to do a, a disintegration of the data. So the, to you, the floor now, uh, Leon. Thank you. Well, um, we're going to look uh, take a closer look at the, the last uh, partner, the Amsterdam City Archives, because uh, uh, what we propose in this presentation, uh, the model and the way we, we, uh, we work with their data, um, is very important for the Golden Nations project, as this is the material to know things about the, the common Amsterdamers. And contrary to the other data providers, the Amsterdam City Archives don't provide their data as RDF straight away. Uh, so this means that we, we ourselves, as a Golden Nations project, have to do some conversion, uh, enrichment and remodeling of the data in order to be, uh, for data to be integrated in research infrastructure. Um, here on the right, you see an overview of the pipeline that describes uh, how we process the data from the notarial archives of Amsterdam. From the notaries of Amsterdam from the 16th century up until the 20th century, we stop in the 19th. Um, in the top, you see the collection of these books, the collection of notarial books. And this is the physical uh, material. The, the books itself were organized in some collection on the attic of the, the archive in Amsterdam. Um, this material is being scanned by a partner. And from these scans, two projects, the, let me take a pointer, the um, All Amsterdam Deeds project, which is a crowdsourcing project, is building an index on this material and the Crowd Learns Computer to Read project, which is training an HDR model, an handwritten text recognition model, in order to get the full text from these notarial reads. Um, we in the Golden Nation project uh, combine these sources, these three different sources, or actually more sources, uh, more sites, uh, on information on notaries, for instance. Um, we aggregate this data, link it back to the original material, in this case, the scan, um, and do, do some further analyses. Uh, perhaps on the full text of an archive uh, by using various NLP techniques. Uh, where possible, we try to identify entities and also link them to external data sets in Tesori. And the famous one, of course, the Getty's AAT or a uh, database on book history, the STCN of the Netherlands. And there was a link below. Uh, this is an example of uh, one of these projects, the All Amsterdam Deeds, which builds the index. Um, in this project, the volunteers are asked to identify the language of the material together with its type, so an attestation in this case. Then they are asked to uh, uh, find the date of the deed and um, uh, draw a rectangular box around every person they, they, they uh, read and um, also for locations that are mentioned, location descriptions. There's also room for a, a little description for the volunteer to enter a free text. The second project, the crowd was computer to read, builds the HDR model and trains the HDR model. In this project, a volunteer is either asked to correct a text that was recognized by a model or other volunteers, or to fully transcribe uh, the contents of a scan. This is done in collaboration with the Tanquibus uh, company, uh, that I, I guess is uh, quite familiar right now. Um, with the idea that if you transcribe a thousand scans that you can um, let the model do uh, 10,000 or maybe more. And this is then what you get when you put all these sources together. Um, in here you see contents um, from the, the archives, the notarial archives. From the index, we know that this is of a type probate inventory. And we know the date of this, uh, this deed, uh, when it was taken and who are the owners that are mentioned, um, who owns this inventory and which other persons are mentioned as beneficiaries, for instance. From the other project, the HDR project, we know the contents. And here on the right, you see a heading which says schilderij or paintings. And below uh, is a list of items that belong to this category. For instance, an item, uh, a painting of the Samaritan worth eight guilder, and from this, we can extract that it's an item of a type of painting uh, that has a depiction of the Samaritan, which, which probably refers to uh, the parable from Luke. It's a valuation of eight guilder in the time. Ideally, we want to connect this description of this very painting to a known painting that is perhaps somewhere in a museum or in an, a private collection. Let's say it's, we can find it uh, over here. Um, then we can uh, have at least have a, a small bit of the, the 
the history of this painting, the, the entire province history of this painting, the movement. But actually, this is quite hard. So if you see descriptions that are also there, uh, a painting of the love or a gathering of peasants. Uh, but already knowing that people had uh, a painting of, uh, of a gathering of peasants at some point in Amsterdam in their house is already interesting for us. It says a lot of, about the cultural industries back then. But now back to the data we have on persons. Uh, from the uh, archives, we have a, a couple of indices uh, on baptism, marriage, burial, but also these notarial deeds and some of those uh, smaller ones on, on sale of estates and, and ships. And these are at least all digitized on a scan level. And of some of these exist index data which, uh, with limited information on person names and location descriptions, but, but never um, information on the objects that are described, uh, such as these cultural goods you saw. Of course, we also have other databases uh, available, a uh, famous one, Wikidata, uh, or the Thesaurus of the Rijksmuseum or the uh, Royal Library. But these mostly contain information on the well-known Amsterdamers, the, the more famous ones, and not the common Amsterdamer. So to find information on, on the commoner, uh, we really have to dig into the archival material. And this also means that we have a challenge to disambiguate between these references to the persons here. Because uh, a person mentioned in a baptism record is by the archive not connected to probably yeah, be the same reference, uh, another reference to the same person in a burial record. And in, in doing your disambiguation, there's a challenge in in, in expressing how you do this, uh, expressing in how to disambiguate and how to model your provenance information. And, and provenance, um, so the relation to the, the master data, this sense is very important to be transparent about your decision making. Um, by definition, provenance it then refers to uh, something coming from a particular source or how something is derived. Uh, or if you are an art historian, you see provenance as the uh, the ultimate derivation or passage of a, a work of art. Uh, the, the Getty Provenance Index is a well-known example of this, that uh, gathers this information. Um, so, so all the steps you need to be transparent about your decisions. And in order to, to go back uh, um, in the process of, of uh, creating your material. And at least we have requirements for, for modeling to be able to keep track of this digitization progress uh, process. Uh, but also our transformation process, uh, maybe like by giving annotations uh, of some sort. Um, at any point in our material, we want to be able to go back in time, back in the in the source, uh, in, the, in the provenance chain, um, which is important for us as being a research infrastructure dealing with re researchers. But in this, we have to find a balance between being very comprehensive and being concise and, and deliver a workable format. Um, and, and some, some uh, model, some ontology was already created for this. Uh, we called it ROAR. It was developed during a time machine data sprint at the University of Amsterdam. Um, and ROAR stands for Reconstructions and Observations in Archival Resources. Might sound familiar by now. And it says that um, a reconstruction uh, can be derived from several observations. And these observations it can be a, um, a person observation, so you make a person reconstruction. And this person, rec uh, person observation is then documented in several archival documents. Each observation comes from one document, um, such as the, the birth certificate or notarial deed. Every step you take is then recorded in the Prov ontology. And where possible, this, this ontology was connected to uh, the, the well-known schema and bio vocabularies. Um, as we already indicated, for the Golden Age project, this is not sufficient. Just knowing something came from a particular source is not enough for us. We want to express um, in, in more detail than this model specifies uh, who, um, yeah, by whom was this decision made, uh, on the basis of what? Uh, what are the other uncertainties involved with the archive or the, the, the creation history of the material? So what we already said, yeah, provenance, we, we need to go back uh, in this process uh, to verify the, yeah, the uncertain information that is there, uh, possibly by an expert, maybe a professor in art history, if we don't trust it. Um, but also, no, we, we uh, realize that 
there are several yeah, different requirements and expectations in the field so that there is no one size fits all model for this. So we come up with a solution and that is an extension to this raw model that features different levels of provenance and interpretation that are each complementary. So one can choose where needed. Uh, do you want to describe something in, in a high level of detail or a quick and dirty way? Um, and this model allows for a very flexible standard in the sense that you can integrate with other ontologies, other vocabularies as well. And we, call it, we still call it ROAR plus plus. So our new approach in modeling this archival material. And, and then here in the table, you see the, the different levels and the, the modules uh, that, um, that build this, uh, this new ROAR model. If we go from the top to the bottom, we first have the, uh, the module of the documents and the collections, which simply indicates uh, at the minimum provenance level, for sure you have to indicate your material is grouped somehow and is, is hosted by some archive. That's the minimum. But if you uh, want to be very uh, detailed or, or a bit more detailed, maybe you also want to keep track of the digitization process of your material and the creation process. By whom was it created or digitized? Um, are we dealing with, that's the, the uncertainties involved in this step, are we dealing with uh, originals or are we dealing with copies because the original was lost in the process? Um, this is mainly the material you would now encode in your um, encoded archival description, your EAD, or maybe in the, the RICO vocabulary. Uh, very basic stuff on, on your material, on the physical material, and maybe the indices. We have the first observation level, content level, in which we describe which are the contents of this physical material. So um, think of the text of a notarial deed. And in the minimum provenance level, we um, indicate which are the, the mentionings of entities on roles that belong to this material. In the detailed level, perhaps we want to indicate uh, on which part of the page some text is highlighted by, uh, by using fragment selectors, for instance. And this is also the place uh, where you can express your uncertainty about uh, the creation of the material, for instance, if the text is delivered by an HCR model instead of by a group of volunteers or by experts in, in uh, 17th century writing. Then the third module, uh, we arrive at uh, the first interpretation level, uh, the direct interpretation, which includes all the events and roles that can directly be observed in a document. So um, the persons involved, the roles they play, and um, the events maybe of type registration. In a detailed level, you want to further break down this. So we, we give an example later on. Um, together with the ambiguities that exist in the inter interpreting the, the references to entities. In the next module, the inner interpretation, you go one step further. Um, let's say that, that a baptism is registered. We know from the direct interpretation that someone was baptized, then we can infer that uh, for sure a, a birth must have happened a few days before or at least before the baptism. And the same goes for a burial registry, uh, for instance. Or in a detailed level, uh, which other entities can be inferred, maybe from a reference to a person who is mentioned together with his, with the widow, with, with his widow. And finally, we have the reconstruction module in which we combine the several observations we made to one individual concept, which is an umbrella term to capture every role that an, um, that an actor is playing um, in, in several archival sources. And in the detailed provenance level, you perhaps want to indicate that you just not combine everything, but only specific parts that you think are relevant for your reconstruction. And again, who is doing the reconstruction, uh, when and what is the state of maybe the archive of the, the person doing so. To illustrate this, um, this is also the figure you find in the abstract, in which we say that um, information, so the contents of a document, is mentioning several entities. Uh, we call them role bearers, which can be a place or a person, organization. And each of these role bearers um, 
are, are, are carrying a, a specific role. The reconstructions are based on several observations, at least two. And the observations are each encoded in a document. Then also we have the uh, inferences, and these are not explicitly mentioned in the document, but can be derived from other observations. You will see an example later on. Um, and very special in this model, the, the role class, uh, which, is, which enables us to store a pergerant type of information, uh, information that is only valid at that point in time, uh, such as someone's age. Um, modeling, um, you, you can model a different observation of a person and connect them through their, say, individual concepts, which is the reconstruction. So the umbrella concept to capture all these roles that people play in archival sources. Let's go back to um, the material to illustrate this. This is an example of an intended marriage. So your intention to, to get married before you get uh, for a marriage uh, event um, from 1660. In there, um, we find that a marriage registry or the intended marriage registry took place. And there are two, at least two bearers, Jan Keuler and Susanna de Bock, each described as Jan Keuler of Hamburg. He's a sugar baker, 29 years old, and his parents are dead. He's living in a still alley. Same for Susanna de Bock of Antwerp, 26 years old and also living in a still alley. Because of the type of events, the intended marriage, we know there, there's a role of groom and a role of bride. Think back of the table. We start in the first row, which is the document level. So we have a collection of uh, baptism, marriage and burial registries from the Amsterdam City Archives. A part of this is the collection of marriage registries. Part of this is the collection of intended marriage registries. And this has again another part, which comes from a specific uh, department of the city, the government. So this is created by an organization. Part of this, uh, this sub-archive, this collection, is a specific book. And this book, a several pages. The page is then digitized as a double page spread in a scan. The book covers uh, the events, in this case, from uh, two years, from 1658 until 1660. But if you add all the books from this collection, you have full coverage events um, of the registration of intended marriages in, in the city. Of this is index made by the city archives, probably uh, 10 or 20 years ago. And this index is, a, is an index of this collection of marriage trees. Part of this is copied to the next slide, in which we see the content of the record. So the full text, in this case, of this uh, uh, marriage record. The um, part of the, uh, the two years in which there has been a registration noted in this particular book, is the actual registration you saw on the scan just now of this uh, Susanna Bock and Jan Keuler. It's a registration of a marriage, marriage intention, uh, which may in several roles. Uh, the city authority, um, the role of uh, Susanna de Bock, the, and uh, the role of Jan Keuler. The first interpretation level then shares this registration event but we extend it further. We know it's of a type marriage registration, so there is also an event of a type intended marriage. Uh, we know this at least has a role of um, uh, bride and a role of groom. There's also a role of witness, and in this case, a role of home location, because it's indicated that they are living in a particular place, uh, the home location, the, the still alley. And added to this are the, the witnesses, and these witness roles are each carried by um, a person observation. The indirect interpretation um, shares the same intended marriage uh, event, which is the observed event from the previous module. But we can say that, well, it's highly likely that they indeed got married. We can model an inferred event of a type marriage, which occurs after 
that is, uh, say, uh, three Sundays after our intention of marriage. Uh, as roles, a husband and a wife, which is then carried by uh, these persons. In the same way, we can say that because we, we, we can read that someone has an, an age of 29, um, well, roughly 29 years earlier, there must have been a birth event with this person involved. Um, we indicate a detailed provenance level that this was derived from um, the informational part H, which was encoded in this integrating description. If we further analyze, analyze this um, and don't see the, the Van Hamburg, which is ambiguous, it can be part of his name, can be, refer, be referring to uh, his place of birth. If we uh, interpret it as the place of birth, we can say that he came from uh, a reference Hamburg, but Hamburg in the role of Hamburg uh, in the 17th century. So you already, um, already saw how you can add these, this detailed provenance uh, um, to it. But um, for instance, you can, can uh, further highlight how your text is located on the page by using the selectors from the web annotation model, dealing with, uh, with scanned material. Um, and if you want to analyze these and, and break down these references to persons like the, the full Jan Kohler von Hamburg, Schubaker, uh, born in... Uh, um, uh, living somewhere into individual parts, uh, perhaps you can use parts from the factor uh, prosopography ontology and see things as, as references, as factoids, statements. This is basically what you just saw in the other slides, only now put on top of uh, scan material. This is the content level. Instead of uh, saying it's this document, we say it's actually this rectangular part. And the interpretation level, um, instead of saying that um, um, the, the young Köhler uh, is in the, the, the content of the document, uh, we say that he mentioned on this uh, smaller rectangle. This is an example uh, that uses the, um, the factoid model, in which the full reference to uh, this person is further split out into a hometown um, that is modeled as a birth location. And again, you can refer to this uh, as an annotation from the, the web annotation model. In order to get to the reconstruction level, we have to find at least one other archival source. So for this, uh, instead of uh, intended marriage of these figures, we found a baptism record. It's a baptism registry uh, took place eight years after, and it bears, it has bearers, several uh, entities uh, of a Katharina, uh, Jan Keuler, with a different spelling, again, Susanna de Bok, Adriana Ruland, and Anna Katharina Moya. It's all in there. Uh, from the type of uh, event, we know there are roles of a child, father, mother, and witness. So here's the reconstruction. What is shared is the observed event you know, from the first interpretation level, in which we remodeled a inferred event, which is the marriage of these two figures. We can, as baptism record, observe the event of the baptism of Christina, child of Jan and Susanna. Uh, because we know it's highly unlikely that you get your child baptized in the 17th century without being married, we can say that um, we uh, from this, we derive marriage events. So we now have two marriage events that share the same, more or less the same figures, only with a slight spelling variation. And the time span overlap. We said this, this should occur after, uh, and this at least uh, should occur before the baptism. And this is the first reconstruction we can make. We can say these are the, the, the same, referring to the same um, event in this case. So they share the same visual concept. You can do the same for the, the, the bearers that are involved. So in this case, uh, Kölder. Two observed persons can be reconstructed into one individual concept. So 
but this was uh, yeah making a reconstruction uh, uh, for uh, the two sources. Uh, if you want to do this by hand uh, with all the yeah, maybe more than four million or maybe five six six million person references in the Ontario archive, it takes a while. So for this, uh, the Golden Age project uh, is developing and further developing the lenticular lenses tool um, that is that we use to reconstruct uh, from millions of observations. Here you see an uh, identity network visualization with several clusters. Uh, in this tool, you can indicate that you want to make links between entities, uh, links between these observations in your data uh, by specifying a, a matching set of rules. For instance, that you indicate that the name of a person between several observations should, should overlap at least 80% or that uh, uh, events should at least share the same year. And then uh, the model tries to find um, evidence for these links in matching against associated clusters. Um, and the interconnectedness of a node in this case coming from four different sources, which three come from the city archives and one from a um, data set with biographical material. Um, the more interconnected the node is, the, the higher the certainty that it's, uh, it's about the same entity. We can zoom in, then it becomes a bit more clear. Um, yeah, you can call it reconstruction, disintegration, or reconciliation. But yeah, in this case, you see um, a cluster of persons with somewhat similar name, Thomas Boers. And he's, uh, he's, he's very uh, connected. These uh, gray edges are links created by the program, and uh, the purple ones are uh, links from the data sets. So we have our biographical database um, manually verified. It says that this groom, Thomas Boers, has been married three times. Uh, so he, he has uh, three spouses in the data. Janetje uh, Potier, Maria Savoye, and Esther Lowe. The other edges here are coming from the archival material. So in this case, from two marriages, um, 10 years apart. And because these um, three nodes um, that um, share associated clusters, uh, this is a cluster, uh, this is another one, and then this is another one, um, th these associated clusters that validate um, or strengthen the certainty that this, this uh, is indeed the same entity, referring to the same entity. So th this is your evidence in proving that these are actually the same. We can do the same for baptism records. Again, you have an associated cluster for uh, two baptism records, uh, which strengthens the certainty that these figures are the same. And these are all connected through the links we created. Um, and if these links share the same, um, um, uh, have, have more or less the same connections, um, it increases the certainty that they are indeed referring to the same individual concept. That it's, it's, it's one reconstruction for these observations. Um, but one of this, uh, these, these uh, nodes uh, is not connected to another associated cluster. Well, in this case, this is left out because no evidence can be found. Uh, there's an option to, to then manually verify this in the, in the tool. Um, and, and, and again, edit um, as a third link or to, uh, to discard it as a, as a false positive. And I think um, yeah, this, this helps, in, uh, this was just zoomed in in the entire cluster. Um, you can do this automatically uh, quite fast for millions of, of entities. And you see how you can boost your certainty by, by modeling your um, material properly. And this, this very much integrates into the idea of storylines. If you combine these roles that someone plays and uh, Charles, uh, up to you. To, yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. Indeed, um, um, Bruce and I have been talking in previous occasions about um, the ontology for storylines of historical evidence. We have been uh, uh, continuing working uh, on this, and there's also a direct relationship that we have seen with uh, with the Rohr model, because it's all about uh, the storylines of historical evidence, all based on provenance, providing provenance, and 
provenance we see for most as uh, giving uh, direct um, relationships to the archive resources. Eh? And that's what Leon just has explained, how we try to link uh, um, the information back to the, the specific lines within the archival um, uh, documents. Uh, in previous meetings, uh, um, Verushka and I have mainly been talking about a time, about uh, an ontology for historical uh, processes, and uh, we have discussed um, the model of uh, George Kupler a couple of times in occasions in, uh, in Lyon and in, uh, in Leipzig and also at the digital events conferences in, uh, in, in Galway and in, in Utrecht. Uh, but here we want to focus more a little bit about um, the, the more recent work that we have done also on uh, the more uh, relationship of the model with the archival uh, sources. So we have both written an extensive uh, chapter uh, for a book which is called uh, Linking Knowledge. Uh, it's now under uh, review, that uh, particular uh, uh, chapter, but we can all already give a little uh, preview. And of course, uh, we hope that it will come out uh, this year and that we can uh, share it further um, with you. Uh, what we have been doing since our last meetings is that we have translated that concept of the storylines of historical evidence now in a model in unified foundational ontology in, uh, in particular UML diagrams. And we have looked also at the connections with uh, c CRM and other um, uh, standards. Uh, can I have the next uh, slide, uh, Leon? So briefly back uh, why we were interested in uh, Kupler. So Kupler uh, described uh, time and, and history as uh, four formal sequences, as a kind of fiber-like structure and a longitudinal uh, structure of parallel lines which sometimes intersect, uh, uh, overlap in networks. Um, and uh, unfortunately, it's, he has only has one little image of that particular network in a footnote in, in his publication. It's the only image in the whole book on the shape um, of time. But it corresponds actually with um, the representation of semantic, three day semantic timelines like the one of Matt Jensen, uh, which is shown um, here. And you can create actually different sort of looks, different sort of views on those networks. You can look at one network in, in time. And so then you have what we call an asynchronous view, but you can also look at multiple uh, networks um, over time, um, what we call an, an asynchronic uh, view. Can I have the next slide, Leon? Um, we already explained also on previous occasions uh, that we, we use the case of, uh, of uh, Rembrandt in particular of the Night Watch because it is a very rich um, uh, story. In Leipzig, we also discussed uh, the idea of bringing together the information uh, of um, the creators and also the copyists. That's so on the right hand side, you see work of Ludens, which made it, and, uh, a copy of the Nacht, uh, Night Watch which actually now provides us information about the original structure because later it was cut the night watch to make it fit into the town hall of Amsterdam. But Koepel is also talking about derivates. So these are kind of adaptations in all sorts of media. And here you see, for example, an, uh, of a tattoo on the back of Mr. Buck, his name is, who visited uh, the Rijksmuseum for the first time just to compare his tattoo with, uh, with uh, the original. Um, the next uh, slide, uh, please. So uh, first of all, um, uh, Ver Verushka has been working further on uh, describing um, the, the, material, uh, the material history of the Night Watch over time eh, and all those relationships with copies and with um, adaptations, uh, which you can um, uh, see here. And uh, if I can get the next slide, uh, Leon. And we can uh, put uh, the, the history of the Night Watch in the context of other works of, uh, of, of uh, Rembrandt. Um, so we first of all have different sorts of, uh, of, of historical evidence that we can see here. So first of all, we can see that uh, the Night Watch um, still exists and the same applies to, uh, to the work which is called Dene. Uh, but we also know that there was another way, work of, of uh, Rembrandt, which was called uh, Christ in the Storm of the Sea of Galilee, which was stolen from uh, Boston. So, but we still do have indirect information about that because there are still pictures known of the original painting. 
But we also have references in archival sources of works that refer to Rembrandt, but with which you have never seen, like the sinus. This is just mentioned in an archival source, but nobody knows what it looked like or whether it exists. So these are multiple levels of, of evidence where also um, uh, Leon was uh, referring to. Um, that means also that if you're starting comparing, can I have the next slide, please, um, uh, Leon? Uh, that means that we, uh, if we look in 2019 on this data about uh, the Nightwatch in, in the context of, um, of uh, the other works of Rembrandt, that we will have different sort of views. If you look at it from the perspective, uh, the material perspective uh, in 2019, then we only will see the Nightwatch and Dene, yeah, because these are the works that are still physically existing. But if we take uh, um, a look at the work, uh, all the work that is known of uh, Rembrandt in 2019, also on the basis of other sources of evidence, then we see the Nightwatch in connection with Dene, but also in connection with the photographs, for instance, of the Christ in the Storm of the Sea of Galilee, or the archival resource of uh, uh, the mentioning of the silent in the archival uh, sources. So we have um, uh, multiple uh, multiple views. Uh, can I have uh, the next one, um, uh, Leon? So um, based on this sort of two multiple levels of evidence, we have tried to model those uh, uh, different sort of uh, stories with multiple levels of evidence into an um, in, in, into an ontological models, and these are. Uh, is actually an ontological model of the views on the data. My, my colleague, uh, Sebastian uh, Dirks, is also present here, often speaks of data scopes in that regard. We believe that if you bring data together, you never can bring all the data together. We also will be limited by the data that we can bring uh, together. That we will have, as historians, we will have multiple perspectives on that data. We have different sort of scape, scapes, uh, scopes on that data. And that is the kind of thing that you could model. You could model a synchronous view. So uh, for instance, looking from the material aspect in 2009, the older works which still exist, but from a different perspective, another historical perspective, you could have a kind of uh, asynchronous view uh, in the context of Latour, one has already spoken over the kaleidoscope view that you align up particular elements of an historical story and in that particular perspective, you can bring them together. You make alignments over time, and these are the asynchronous views. So that's what we we're trying uh, to, uh, to model. Um, these, in that chapter that I referred to, there are multiple um, examples. This is just an, uh, a glimpse. Um, but uh, if I uh, can go to the next slide, uh, Leon. Um, for the moment, we are still uh, looking at how we can um, map further to existing ontologies. And also we are looking, for instance, how we can map uh, to uh, Sidok Siram. Um, uh, Farushka already indicated in her UFO uh, model uh, how this relates to the specific classes in uh, Sidok Siram, um, uh, but uh, also Leon mentioned other uh, the, different sort of standards like AIAD, for instance, or particular standards which are used in the context of uh, archive resources. So that's what when you're trying to do, uh, to bring that together. And uh, Leon also has been talking about uh, the lenticular lenses tool. So the whole way of um, get a grip on the data and, and also to work more on entity extraction. And that's another aspect that we are doing in the same time. Can I have the, the last slide uh, of the, the next slide, uh, Leon? So, and the next step then will be once we uh, have developed those uh, models uh, further and our tools are developed that we really would like to bring that together in onto me to see how we can map that to the other ontologies which are uh, assembled in the context of the data uh, for history uh, project. So um, the final uh, slide, uh, Leon. So I just would like to, to thank you also on, on behalf of uh, uh, Leon and Voruska for this uh, uh, for this possibility to talk a little bit more about our project, in particular about uh, uh, the Roar++ model uh, developed by Leon and uh, and uh, by uh, Voruska. Uh, these are only two members of the whole project, but there are far more people involved. So if you're interested, uh, go to our uh, website and you can see what everyone is doing. Um, if you have particular questions about the project as a whole, you can contact me. 
And if you uh, need more information about how uh, we model archival resources, please go back to Leon and uh, Veruska, of course, that you have seen Veruska before and other uh, occasions is still working on the overall ontologies of the storylines. So thank you very much for this possibility.